Williams, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup, all the way from Washington, D.C. You are a Ph.D. student in the Center for the Advanced Study of Human Paleobiology at George Washington University and study the fossil record as a way of understanding the evolutionary history of the African hominin Paranthropus. Welcome to the show, Alexis. So uh, how are things going over there? Are you able to get into the university or are you working from home like so many of us during this pandemic? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. Um, I am working from home. Um, hopefully soon we'll all be in a situation where it'll be possible for us to go back in the field. Um, but right now I'm focusing on, on working at home and doing what I can until then. Well, before we dive into the world of these fascinating hominins, let's hear about your background. Did you always have an interest in human ancestry and in particular, Paranthropus? Yeah, well, I got my undergraduate degrees in evolutionary biology and biological anthropology at the University of Iowa, where I was mostly interested in Neanderthals and modern humans um, with Dr. Franciscus there. And while working on them, I, I realized that what I found the most fascinating about Neanderthals were the differences between Neanderthals and modern humans. Um, and I think what makes them so fascinating to a lot of people are the similarities, because that's what makes them relatable. But to me, um, the more interesting thing was uh, were the differences, because then um, you can look at the differences in morphology and behavior and start to um, ask questions like, um, why are we here and they aren't, and that sort of thing. And so that piqued my interest interest to look at differences, and I got um, more interested in the species that came earlier in time, so farther back mm -hmm. in time, um, and specifically I found Paranthropus, which I fell in love with, and um, so now I'm working um, with Dr. Bernard Wood at GWU, as you mentioned, and um, because Paranthropus are highly derived in their own respect, and so therefore they have so many more differences compared to Neanderthals and us, and so um, I'm looking uh, more interested in looking at the differences there, and specifically now on change in morphology over time, so their anatomy and how that's changed over time, as well as some paleoecological questions too. Right. Well, the genus Paranthropus might not be familiar to everyone. It's a side branch hominin, uh, a group of species not massively understood, but that still manages to intrigue. Recently, a new, very complete skull of Paranthropus was found shedding more light onto this mysterious species. So what about this genus, generally speaking? Can you uh, give us an overview? Definitely, yeah. So Paranthropus, uh, the genus Paranthropus has about three species that we know of right now. Two of them are eastern species, so those would be Ethiopicus and Boisei, and then there's one southern species called Robustus. Um, Ethiopicus is the first of those three to appear in the fossil record around 2.6 million years ago, so it's the oldest. Um, it has many fascinating parts of the skull, so one of them is that it's extremely prognathic, which means means that the upper maxilla or upper jaw um, is extended forward quite a bit, um, like, like a snout on a baboon or a dog, but less rounded. Mm. Um, and then it also has a sagittal crest. So at the top of their head, there's a, a, a thin piece of bone that goes across. Um, ours is flat. Right, um, but that's where the temporalis muscle attaches um, and it's going to insert on the mandible. And so we know that because that's there for them, um, they must have relied heavily on their robust chewing muscles. Um, and then if we go on to the other eastern species, Boisei, Mm -hmm. That's the one I'm most interested in. It comes a little later, so it's a potential descendant of Ethiopicus. Um, it came afterwards, whether that be because of speciation or whether that be because of anagenesis, we're not really sure yet. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised in the future if we found fossils that were overlapping in their dates. But Boisei has extremely large teeth. We call it post-canine um, hypermegadontia, which means after the canine tooth, so the premolars and the molars in the back of the mouth, those are extremely large, and it's what they're known for. Um, and then uh, the southern species, Robustus, despite its name, is actually the, um, not mm -hmm. as robust as, as Boisei, so that's a little misleading. But they're the southern species. They lived about two to one million years ago in South Africa. 
Um, and they were very prolific on, on, on the landscape. They were actually probably more common, we think, than members of our own genus Homo. Um, and all three of these species were likely upright. We can look at the frame and magnum um, at the bottom of the occipital bone of the skull and see that it's relatively forward um, so mm -hmm. that when their spinal cord attaches to it, it's, it's upright. So I can sit upright and I can walk upright bipedally because my frame and magnum is pushed forward. Um, quadrupeds will have the frame and magnum at the back of their skull. And so the vertebral column comes out parallel to the ground, um, as you see in like gorillas and chimpanzees. And another thing about all three of them is that they had relatively small brains. And so the cranial capacity there is only slightly larger than a gorilla's. It's about 550 cc's, where a gorilla's is about 500 cc's. And that's a pretty big difference compared to modern humans, where we average around 1,300 to 1,500 cc's. Right, let's concentrate now on one of those species, Paranthropus boisei, because this is a species on which you focus most of your work. Uh, what can you tell us about boisei, and why is the species of uh, such interest to you? Yeah, well, boisei is perhaps the strangest hominin species in that clade of Paranthropus. It's actually likely the strangest hominin we've found thus far in, in any, in any uh, clade of, of hominin. So, um, and that's because it has a very strange mixture of, of traits that we really don't have a comparative model for. So I'll get to that in a second. But um, so first of all, it does still have a sagittal crest, like Aethiopicus, a little less, but still there, um, which is surprising considering that compared to Aethiopicus, it has an extremely reduced prognathism. So it actually has a pretty flat face um, more closely, you know, similar when you look at it to ours, our face is pretty flat, right? And so those those traits are already strange, especially considering that Boisei is found around 2.3 million years ago to sometime after 1.4 million years ago. And so this is pretty far back in time. And you already are seeing um, really low levels of prognathism mixed with traits we would consider more primitive, like the sagittal crest. Um, and that, again, is mixed with, with more traits where you have a really small brain case, right? But that's mixed with the frame and magnum being pushed anterior, and so we know that they were likely bipedal as well. And so you have some traits like us and some traits not like us. And then um, if you look at their face from the front, they actually have very wide faces, and that's partially due to their flaring zygomatics. So the zygomatics are your cheekbones here, and they actually circle back and connect to your temporal bone. Um, and what that does is it creates a hole. If you look at the top of the cranium, it creates this hole where the temporalis muscle, if you remember, that attaches to the sagittal mm -hmm. crest, or for us, just the side of the skull, um, it passes through that hole to attach to the mandible. And so we know that um, we can see that since they have such flaring zygomatics, that hole is actually greatly enlarged compared to ours, and that that temp temporalis muscle, therefore, um, would be able to be um, bigger, more robust. And so those traits go together to tell us they were likely very reliant on that chewing apparatus, uh, likely chewing tough foods like vegetation. And we can look at the isotopes there in the teeth and see that they were mostly consuming C4 vegetation. So those would be things like grasses and sedges, uh, which then leads me to their teeth, which I would be remiss to mention again. Um, they have um, post-canine megadontia, so uh, very large teeth after the canine. And to put that into perspective, um, their molars are actually four times as large, roughly, than a, um, a modern human's molars. So if we put, put four of our molars kind of in mm. a square, that would be the relative size of just one of their molars. So these things were, you know, massive. And that's extremely interesting if you consider that their front teeth, so their incisors and canines, are extremely small in comparison. And this is one of the things that makes them a really unique species because we don't have a comparative model for that. When we look at the great apes, such as uh, chimpanzees and gorillas, um, and we look at Paranthropus, who has um, a very large amount of sexual dimorphism. In this case, the males would be uh, that we find are much larger than the females that we find. 
We can see that in the great apes where the male gorillas and male chimps are on, on average um, quite a bit larger than the females, right? But in their species, if we look at their social structure, as a comparison, it doesn't quite uh, match up because the males have relatively much larger canines uh, than the females do, and that's for male-male competition, has nothing to do with diet. Um, and so this leaves us with no comparative model because paranthropus males do not have very large canines. And so um, this overall leaves us knowing that they have just a very unique set of traits, some of them a lot like us in the case that they were bipedal and they had less prognathism, some things um, not like us but like other animals that we do know, such as a sagittal crest like gorillas and orangs have, um, and then some things were just derived and extremely unique to them, like having extremely hypermechadont back teeth but very small front teeth. And I think uh, I might be wrong, but uh, it was the Leakeys who found Boise. Isn't that right? They pay the anthropologists, uh, the, the yes. Leakeys, and they called him Nutcracker Man. Yeah, I think um, I think Philip uh, Tobias actually nicknamed him that in one of oh. his um, yeah in one of his his writings. And so yes, and so they, their their jaws are so massive that you can just make that comparison. And it's it's debated whether or not they ate nuts that frequently. Um, it might have just been like a fallback food, but definitely as a visual, um, you can see why the comparison was made. Uh, their their jaws are just massive. But with that setup, obviously they were chewing hard stuff all day long, probably. Yeah, probably. Vegetation actually takes a lot longer to you know consume and digest than um, meat would take because meat mm -hmm. is like us and like on like can digest easier than vegetation mixed with animal, right? Just as a simple comparison. And so they would have probably needed very large digestive tracts, for example, kind of like a gorilla. They're likely eating just constantly all day um, considering the amount of um, how far into the C4 range they must have been and how um, not cut out for meat eating um, their teeth were. Well, when the Leakeys were searching for tool-making homonyms many decades ago, they initially discovered the more ape-like Paranthropus rather than the more human-like tool-maker that they were expecting. An intriguing question to ask then is, despite what the Leakeys thought, could Paranthropus uh, have used tools? Yeah, that's a question that um, a lot of people have become more interested in, so scientists are starting to ask that now, and so I'm looking forward to what they find um, in the future. But it's also interesting to look at through a historical lens, as you mentioned. So Mary Leakey found Paranthropus boisei in 1959, and this was years after that her and Lewis found hundreds of stone tools at Old Divide Gorge, right? And so they knew the stone tools weren't making themselves. They were on the lookout for a hominin tool maker, and they had, you know, it in their heads that it would probably look a lot like us, where, you know, it would still have some primitive features, but it would have a relatively larger brain and it would have a small face. Those were the predictions that kind of everyone was thinking at that time. Um, and so when she found Paranthropus, it was really strange because Paranthropus is none of those things, right? As I mentioned, it had a very small brain case, a very large face. Um, so that, that didn't quite make sense, but that's it. That's what they had. And so it was proclaimed the tool maker for, you know, those couple of years. Um, it was a hominin. It was in the right place at the right time. And so that's why it was designated that way. And then, you know, a couple of years later, they find Homo habilis and things start, you know, falling into place of, okay, you know, maybe that's the hominin that was actually making these stone tools because that much more closely matches what they were expecting with a relatively larger brain case, a very small, gracile face, right? Um, that's actually why Homo habilis is named Homo habilis. It means um, handyman. Mm. However, um, it is very likely that Paranthropus did use tools. Um, and we know this from um, like a systematic standpoint, uh, a phylogenetic standpoint, when we look at um, parsimony and like think about a common ancestor, because great apes, most of them show tool use, 
Um, even some monkeys, like capuchins mm. and macaques, oh. can show tool use. And so we know that the common ancestor that used tools is likely much, much older than anything um, close to Homo habilis, right? And even maybe even before the splits in the great ape clade, right? So we know that because of parsimony, it's it's likely that Paranthropus was using tools. Mm. So mm. the the questions then become, um, what kind of tools were they using? Um, if they were using stone tools, have we found them and not attributed them to the right species? And then if that is the case, you know, what were they using them for? Um, yeah, and, and so actually speaking about that, that que those questions are, are hindered right now um, by the fact that we have very, very little fossil evidence of postcrania, especially for the eastern species, Boisei and Ethiopicus. We have some of robustus, especially some hand um, bone fossils that have been associated with robustus. And when we look at those, um, we see that they actually anatomically we're capable of what we would call a precision grip and that's when you know we do like this it's more of a finesse grip and so we associate that with the anatomical capability of making stone tools but whether or not they were making stone tools and why um, and have we found them is a different question well your work focuses a lot on not only Paranthropus but other species of homonyms that were also around during the same time period. So could competition between these species have affected their evolution and perhaps even the eventual evolution of human beings? Yeah, I think there's a strong probability that that was occurring at least to some extent. Um, and this is because Ecologically, there's this observation that's been repeated multiple times in many different um, animals and plant studies um, for a while that shows that species that are more closely related to each other and are competing for the same resources experience competition to a higher degree and therefore they would have higher rates of character displacement, which is essentially when the two species start to repel each other either morphologically or behaviorally, so that over time they start occupying different niches and therefore they're competing for at least slightly different resources, if not eventually completely different resources. And so this happens because if, if you get a trait that lets you, you know, occupy a slightly different resource, you would then um, be competing less with the other direct species and you'd have more resources to invest in offspring and therefore have more offspring to pass along that trait. And over many, many, you know, uh, cycles, um, this can produce pretty disparate results in, in species that were once very similar to each other. And so when we look at the Omotorkana Basin, you know, a couple million years ago, we see that there are at least three different species there at the same time. Um, these include Paranthropus boisei, um, it includes Homo habilis and uh, Homo rudolfensis, depending on how you want to speciate those, and then as well as Homo erectus or Homo ergaster, depending on how you want to speciate those, right? So, and those are all very closely related hominins, right? They're, they're all hominins, they're all, you know, bipedal apes, and so they would fall under that category of being closely related and in the same place at the same time. So. Um, it's very likely that competition amongst those species did push, um, or were one of the pressures that pushed the lineages into, you know, kind of where they were going. And I think it's really interesting to think about how species that we consider to be so unlike us, like Paranthropus, could have, you know, really pushed us into the direction that we, you know, we ended up in um, because we were beside them for, you know, a million years, right? And so that's a lot of evolutionary time to trying to not overlap in niches. So there's no way that perhaps like Erectus could have preyed upon Paranthropus, do you think? Was that a bit weird? I have, I mean, I, I do not know. We know that Erectus was likely eating meat um, and it's likely that the C4 signals that are showing up in Erectus were because they were eating animals that were eating C4 foods. That can happen. Um, but I don't think any fossils have shown um, bite marks or tool marks on an actu on the actual Paranthropus bone. So I don't think that question's been, been answered yet. 
Yes, and perhaps the Paranthropus could actually fight back with those stone tools we mentioned. <laughs> Maybe that's what they were using them for. <laughs> well, the Paranthropus line came to an abrupt halt and disappeared from the fossil record around 1.4 million years ago. The question that I know many people are wanting to ask is, why did they go extinct? Yeah, so the fossil record in this particular area of East Africa um, kind of stops around 1.4 for a brief period of time and then picks up again around 1 million years ago. And we stop seeing them after it picks up again. And so we assume they went extinct between that 1.4 and 1 hmm. million years ago. Um, and there are a couple reasons um, that people have put forward for why they went extinct. One of them um, that's pretty popular is that since they're morphologically stable or they appear morphologically stable through time, um, if you make the assumption that staying morphologically um, consistent over time is equivalent to having less variation, at least genetically, um, then it makes sense that once the environment starts to change 1.4 million years ago or even you know before or after that, um, that they wouldn't be able to adapt as quickly and therefore they would have gone extinct sometime after that starts. Um, another one that's pretty common is that you see is that the, the smaller brained uh, genera such as Paranthropus and Australopithecus, so it includes Australopithecus Played as well that had relatively smaller brains compared to Homo, um, just couldn't compete with the larger brained um, genus Homo, and, and that over time that competition became too much, and therefore each you know species in, in those two genera um, went extinct in their own right. Um, in reality, I think it's very likely that a mixture of factors caused Paranthropus to go extinct. Um, some of them likely even neutral forces of evolution, right? So genetic drift probably played at least some part in why they went extinct as well. And I think it's important to note that extinction is a natural and expected um, part of evolution and ecology. And um, as long as you're not, you know, including human-caused extinctions that we, we do because of deforestation and things like that recently, 99.9% um, .9 of the animals that have once lived on this earth are currently extinct, right? So we expect it to happen. It's going to happen to us one day. And if you think about it, our species has actually only been around um, for about a fourth as long as Paranthropus did. Mm. Um, and so in that respect, they were actually quite successful mammals. And I know in your work you've mentioned something called character displacement. Is that what you're describing mm -hmm. here? Um, for the competition, um, hmm. probably. Um, so when when two separate species are closely related and they're they're competing for the same resource, you're going to notice that their morphology over time changes, or that's something that can happen. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens sometimes that we notice. And so their um, their morphology is going to start looking a lot different, which is why Paranthropus looks a lot different than Homo, or it's one of the potential reasons why Paranthropus looks a lot different than Homo, is that they're in the same place at the same time. Um, and that could definitely lead to um, reasons why they went extinct is that even though they went through character displacement and they look different, or I'm assuming they went through character displacement to look different, um, they, they could still have an overlap of resources by being in the same place at the same time and therefore not be able to compete against the larger brained Homo, who that's the that's the you know evolutionary trajectory that Homo took. They kept getting larger brains, right? Um, that's the push that happened for them, and that just became too much. And in parenthesis went extinct. So that's that's a potential um, reason for why they're no longer here. Well, before we wrap up, we should really talk about that new Paranthropus robustus discovery described only last year in 2020. Alexis, this is a pretty exciting find. So uh, what does this latest skull tell us about the genus that we didn't know before? Yeah, so um, DNH155 is the specimen. It's beautifully preserved, if, if you've seen it. Um, it's an adult male. Um, cranium of Paranthropus robustus, so it's the southern species of Paranthropus. And it has a mixture of traits. 
that we see that includes um, a, di a different size of, of the face, um, that it shares with the um, older deposits that it's in. So it's dated to about two million years ago. Um, and it shares these suite of characteristics with uh, another specimen that I believe is DNH7. Um, and they're both in, in, the same, in the same deposit. And then um, if we look at the younger deposits that come a little bit after them, we notice that the suite of characteristics that those have is just slightly different but, but still distinct compared to DNH155. Um, and so it's a beautiful example of, of microevolution happening in the same species um, over time. Right, those changes from one, you know, population to, to the next, you know, many, many generations later, right? And so it's also very important because especially this far back in the fossil record, so this is two million years ago, right? Mm -hmm. The the resolution we get between strata is usually not this close. And so um, it's really great that we can see this microevolution happening within a species of hominin um, that far back in time. Wow, that was such a fascinating dive into the world of this much misunderstood group of creatures. And well, thank you, Alexis, for taking the time to come on to this show and talk about your research. So uh, what are you working on now? Uh, what's your latest project? Yeah, well, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for, for having me. I could talk about Paranthropus all day, so I greatly enjoyed this. Um, last year, I, I just published um, uh, an article with Bernard Wood, um, an American scientist, about Paranthropus, actually. So it's similar. It's just a basically an overview on Paranthropus and specifically um, about Boisei. And then this year, I'm looking forward to working more on my dissertation, which, as you mentioned a couple of times, will be on character displacement. Um, and I'm starting to develop, uh, hopefully, hopefully this year, more on um, a different animal or organism as a comparative model, um, at least for Paranthropus um, ecologically. So I'm hoping to start working on that soon. I will leave links to your work and social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again, Alexis, for coming on to Evolution Soup. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a really great time. Um, and if anyone out there um, has questions for me after this, feel free um, to send me an email as well.